In this issue of Fashion Classics, go back in time to 1992, when comfort ruled and knitwear took center stage around the world. From France, you'll meet knitwear pioneer, designer Sonia Riquiel. And 1992's star on the rise, model Megan Douglas. Step into the comfortable yet stylish shoes of Robert Clergery. Plus, Italy's queen of cashmere, Lara Biagiotti. It was a perfect blend of form and function, comfortable chic, circa 1992. Flashback, fall 1992. Comfort was top priority. Knits offered a warm embrace and ruled the runways like never before. Knits have made a major comeback this season because they answer so many fashion requirements. Knits are modern, knits are comfortable, knits are easy to wear, and this season knits look great. Well, you know, knits are terribly, terribly com uh, comfortable, and uh, there was nothing better on the body than uh, a knit. It's because I, the important thing now is the woman wants to be attractive and they want to be sexy and they want to be seductive, but they want to be comfortable. Comfort made fashion news as designers around the world embraced plush knits. I just love knitwear, just all that knitted dressing and jersey fabrics and um, some of it looks like knitwear but it is actually made like, you know, proper clothes, it's just knitted fabric. Very, very important for modern women, I think, really. In London, designers knit it long and lean. What I love about Nicole is it's so easy to wear and uh, it can be casual, it can be dressier and you can adapt it with anything, you can put it on top of suits or underneath a coat, I mean it's so uh, flexible and um, you can do so much with it as well. In 1992, layers of knits were the warmest alternative. It looks very sophisticated um, and it's comfortable, I mean you know women don't want to go around you know, in uncomfortable things. They don't want a jacket that they can't take off because they haven't got anything kind of proper underneath. You know, knitwear, is a, I guess, is kind of a, an acceptable alternative to wear in the office or wear out to a special occasion or whatever. From day to night, knits heated it up in London. I love knitwear, that's why <laughs> we work it. But um, I think it's so comfortable for us, for instance, it's easy. We love to play with pattern. And it's the, the fabric that allows to, to work out a pattern and then it travels so well in it well. In Milan, the Italians created sensual knits. A complete uh, sensual freedom for everybody to wear as you need and as you love. Like. From elegant coat dressing to outerwear, 92's knits equaled comfort. I think it's comfortable and women enjoy it and women live very busy lives today and uh, they can understand that knitwear can be worn day or evening. Fur cuffs and ornamentation enrich classic Italian knitwear. We always do knits. Very comfortable, uh, mostly white uh, cashmere and wool, but principle has to be comfort and uh, freedom. And freedom suited the mood of 1992. Knitwear is one of the most modern uh, uh, kind of clothes and it's very affordable, it's very suitable and uh, it's really something so uh, easy and I think I think in the collection it's the most modern part of the collection. I adore doing it as well. In the past as well as today, knits have always lent themselves well to texture and pattern. Knit. Knit is very important at this moment. Ultra sophisticated and ultra chic, Parisian knits walked the cutting edge. 
Number one is knitwear. I felt uh, strongly for the re-emergence of knitwear because of the new proportions. Um, the proportions that I love are long and lean, and um, my true love, Mr. Media Man, is knitwear. They're just a part of modern life. It's not even fashion per se, it's just comfort. Well, it looks like we're really in for a knitwear revival. The Knitwear Revolution of Fall 1992. Now meet 1992 newsmaker Lara Biagioti, Italy's queen of cashmere. The fall 92 collection marked Biagioti's 20th year in design. By 1992, her fashion empire had expanded to include boutiques, sunglasses, perfume, accessories, and a specialty line called Cashmere Express. But it's all a labor of love for Lara. I think that fashion is a special uh, job, a special career, a special love maybe that uh, takes so much of your personality, of your attention and efforts that uh, you feel always uh, the first day of your career. And uh, looking back, uh, I can discover what is right and what is wrong. What is right is maybe that I create a style who is the most important thing for a designer, that people recognize you for certain uh, capital things you have done in your life, uh, feminine uh, fashion, uh, white, cashmere, and many things. Luxurious cashmere has always been Biagioti's hallmark. But with the exorbitant price of cashmere, it had become a luxury few could afford. So with her husband Johnny, Lara developed Cashmere Express bringing the pleasure and comfort of cashmere to everyone. Lauren has decided to uh, make a special merchandise for her own store. And at this point, we have been able, by cutting all the middle initiatives like agents uh, or intermediates, and um, propose to the public a price which is approximately 20 to 30 percent cheaper than any other store in this uh, city. It's a new system of uh, proposing to the retailer a, an expensive uh, collection at reasonable prices. The mystery of cashmere is uh, I am studying since a long time and uh, I discovered that it is a pleasure for yourself. Although Lara's design throne is padded with cashmere, she also works with many other fabrics to create a look that's distinctly her own. In 92, she reflected on her memorable 20 years in the world of fashion. I try to study, not just to use fashion, but to respect fashion a lot and to be very grateful to fashion, to the opportunity it gives to me in the years. And I think that uh, if uh, in some case I have to born again, maybe I will be always uh, behind the stage to do this uh, terrible and very fascinating job. Italy's cashmere queen, Lara Biagioti. Knits were more important than ever for fall 1992, and cashmere has always been considered the most luxurious knit of all. But did you ever wonder why it costs so much? Here's an inside look behind the mystique of cashmere. The magic begins in Lower Mongolia, high atop the Asian Himalayas. At the end of each bitter winter, nomadic tribesmen herd the wild cashmere goats that inhabit the mountains of the region. During the spring molting, each goat is hand-combed to reveal the soft, silky underfleece that will become luxurious cashmere. It takes the fleece of three or four goats to make just one sweater, and up to 24 for an overcoat. Next, the painstaking process of sorting, cleaning, and dyeing takes place, often in small Scottish towns. And finally, it makes its way to the designers, who combine their artful craftsmanship with their innate love of the luxurious fiber. 
the way it's treated here, because in Italy we have the best meals to treat the, the regional raw yarn and diet, uh, you feel uh, comfortable like uh, Linus in his blanket, you know. <laughs> I think sometimes that Kashmir can even treat some uh, small diseases and uh, make you feel like you're more comfortable, you're more safe, you know. Just because it feels so divine, it's like it's just it's like pure silk. I think that the cashmere is absolutely amazing because I don't think anyone would ever expect it can be so sexy. I think that they're all used to it being so proper and very, you know, uptight and la di da, as they say. While the luxurious fiber has expanded beyond its conservative image, cashmere will never lose its traditional appeal. It combines comfort and utility, warmth and sensuality, all in one incredibly soft package. And if it costs a little more, well, everyone deserves a little luxury now and then. Next, meet model Megan Douglas, the international face of 1992, who's still in demand today. Hey, I'm from Vienna, Virginia. I'm 22. I just had my birthday. And we're here in Milan. <laughs> I really grew up overseas, and I came back like when I think was nine years old and went to elementary school there, finished off in high school, and then left for Paris. should have seen me when I grew up now. I wasn't a really cute kid. I guess my parents thought I was cute, but I think I've gotten better. <laughs> Megan's name was on everyone's lips in 1992. Now Megan's wonderful. Megan's incredible. She's been in most of our shows. It's not, it's not a new love, it's, but she looks better than ever. When we first found her a couple of years, I guess about a year and a half ago, we, we thought she's absolutely great can be exotic as well as classic, but also great fun. Whatever you do to her, you can do big hair on her, and it seems like the face looks very modern. She's sort of clean cut, sexy. It's a rare blend. And it's Megan's unique blend that's kept her working throughout the 90s. With a constantly evolving look, Megan was more than just a fleeting fashion fancy. First time I saw it, I was like, that's not me. I can't believe it. No. But it's nice. I mean, it's a different person each time. I, you know, you portray someone. It's like a dream, you know? You're like this one person one day, and you feel like someone else the next day, and you're yourself because you have to put yourself into it. But, you know, what you are at home is really different than what you are in the magazines most of the time, but at least I am. And it's nice. I mean, seeing pictures of yourself is always nice if you look good. <laughs> Megan was equally successful on the runway. What am I thinking about? Um, I hope they like me. No, I guess so. No, um, I don't know what I'm thinking about. I sort of daze off because I used to have this fear of like lots of people in a room and I'd be like, <gasps> you know, and I clammed up and stuff. But no, now I'm getting better at it. I'm comfortable. You know, I'm just walking out there showing the clothes, trying, you know, to sell it. <laughs> It is a little bit glamorous, and you see people, and you're like, so-and-so is in the crowd. Did you see Dino Donner? No. But, you know, I think it's more like the pictures. I'm going to show my grandkids. That's what Grandma used to look like, you know? It's tough work. I think you need a strong head. You get a lot of rejection. You get a lot of people accepting you. And you have a lot of people telling you you're beautiful and gorgeous. You just have to know who you are, and if you know who you are, you know, you're all set. Because, you know, beauty is what's inside, and finally outside goes, and you have to be stuck with what's inside. You have to like who you are. I do like this job. I mean, I think if you're unhappy with something, change to something else. I know the money's really good in this job and everything else, but if you're not happy, it's not worth it. Life's too short. Sonia Riquiel never dreamt of becoming a famous fashion designer. She just wanted to raise a family. But after she married a shop owner, the clothes she designed for herself started getting attention. 
In time, this accidental designer built an empire based on her famous knitwear. By 1992, with her grandchildren stealing the show and daughter Natalie helping to run the company, her close-knit family was still a top priority. I designed for a certain kind of women who are mixed with my daughter, my sister, my friends, me, my mother, my grandchildren, and every, all the women there. We, we are in the same area. We have, we have this, the same uh, spirit. We take care about what happened in the world, about uh, in a social way, in a political way. Then I put everything of that in my clothes. And Sonia has stayed true to her vision. It's Ricky L trademarks like bold strokes of color and whimsical touches that helped her become world renowned for her knitwear. Ricky L was the, one of the pioneers of knitwear as far as really um, dressing it up and making women feel comfortable in it at all hours of the day. And I think she continues to um, make fashion contributions in the knitwear category. Through the years, Ricky L's signature became identifiable by its long, lean line and simple silhouette. Her fashion is much more an emphasis on clothes themselves as, as opposed to fashion. I mean, she doesn't make such strong fashion statements. She really wants the woman to shine through her clothes. Riquiel says that she designs for a slightly mysterious woman who loves her work as well as her children. It's a strong yet feminine look that has endured through the decades. A woman of great staying power and obviously a woman of great femininity because she survived so many decades with a look that she invented. The sweater dress is hers. She's the queen of it. It was the knit pullover that originally put Riquiel on the fashion map. Easily adaptable to the changing moods of fashion, Riquiel's pullovers have been a staple in every collection. The pullover is a, it's a, a modern way of life because you, you can move with, with the pullover. You can be sophisticated, you can be curious, you can be perverse, you can be fatal. It's only the way you, you, you wear the pullover. It's only the way you move with it and the way you make you put some accessory on it. I love this. I love the sweater. Twice a year, Sonia stages her ready-to-wear shows in Paris. With daughter Natalie directing the productions, Sonia focuses on those final touches that have made her a design legend. She really invented something very specific about knitwear. But I think so far now, her contribution to fashion has gone much beyond that, beyond, uh, further. And uh, it's very easy to say that, but I think she has a very special place. I don't think she's couture, I don't think she's créateur, I don't think she's prêt à porter. I think she's quite unique. I think she's the only woman today of this caliber designing for other women. Uh, I think she's invented a style, definitely. For the hardworking Riquiel, designing is truly an art, and each collection a creative challenge. I am like a writer, you know. I, I write a, a book since 20 years, and each season I add a chapter to that book, and that is a... Um, it's fashion for me. A standout of 1992, French knitwear innovation from Sonia Riquiel. Now take a step into 1992's comfortable yet trendy shoes of Frenchman Robert Clergerie. Considered one of Europe's premier contemporary shoe designers, Clergerie is a favorite of many top couturiers, as well as avant-garde dressers the world over. Although he strongly believes in simple style, it's capturing the comfort of men's shoes for women that's his primary objective. The first day I went into this factory, I felt in love with the product. And I felt in love with the raw material, with the leather. I started working on collection, and the factory I took on my own was an 
making, manufacturing men's shoes. So I utilized this technology of men's shoes to design a woman's shoes. And I was alone to have this idea. As always, comfort and high style go hand in hand with Clergerie's signature simplicity. I consider that style is more important than fashion. And for me, when you design a product, if it is simple, it's much better. Because when you try, when you start to complicate, when you start to add trim on a product, that means you don't have the strong and right idea. If your idea is strong, it's like when you speak, when what you think is clear in your head, you express it simply. You'll rarely find a complicated trim on Clergerie's no-nonsense footwear. Instead, you'll find modern lines and a philosophy that says, if the shoe fits, they'll wear it. The first quality of a shoe is to walk with it. So um, when I design a new last, I pay attention to the fitting, to be comfortable, to pay attention to the size. Don't try to, to, to have a smaller look and, uh, and to, to have a, after to, to suffer. You know, it's horrible when you have a pain on the foot. I utilize the best material and the most expensive. It's possible it doesn't appear at the first sight, but by wearing the shoes, you realize it's a good material because if it is of a good usage and it is nice looking. In his 25 years of making well-dressed women feel comfortable in their shoes, Clergery has earned the gratitude of his fans. I'm very flattered because a lot of women, they know Clergery, and the first, say, the first thing they say, thank you, we are comfortable, and your shoes are of, of good usage. Comfortable chic for 1992 and beyond, from Robert Clergery. So what was the must-buy item for fall 1992's head-to-toe comfort? Designers were cushioning fashion with quilted coats. Here's a look at some of the season's best. Quilted Coats, the hottest look for fall 1992. It's a fashion flashback to the comfort zone from Fashion Classics. <laughs>